All right, good day, everyone. Um, warm greetings from, uh, from Glenn, Nikki, and I. Um, it's been a while since we last connected with everyone via one of our, our webinars, and we're very excited to be back after a short mid-year break. Um, this week, we're off to the exotic island of Taiwan, and uh, we really appreciate you joining us. Situated in East Asia, Taiwan is officially part of the People's Republic of China and is well regarded among the birding community as a must visit part of the world due to its high number of special and endemic birds, including endemic subspecies, which Glenn will certainly go into some detail about during his presentation. Many classic Asian families are found on the islands and birds like magpies and laughing thrushes, pheasants, partridges and bush robins all rank highly among those who have been before or indeed those who have dreamed about going and opened the field guide as well. So to take us to Taiwan is one of Rock Jumper's longest serving tour leaders, uh, who also happens to be one of my favorite people in the world. And that's my brother, Glenn Valentine. I know that many of you attending today's webinar have traveled with Glenn before and know firsthand how enthusiastic and passionate he is about birds, conservation, world travel, and indeed other wildlife. Glenn is also no stranger to our Dream Destination webinar series, having blown us away with his overview of the remote West Papuan Islands cruise back in July last year, which surely ranks as one of the most exotic and exciting trips you could ever hope to enjoy. While a few months back in March this year, he showcased China's fantastic Sichuan province, home to a plethora of fabulous pheasants, Grand Dollar, and many more. If you haven't yet seen those, uh, those particular webinars, uh, jump onto our site and, and you can take a trip back down memory lane. Uh, Glenn himself began his rock jumper guiding career back in 2006 while he was still completing his finance degree at university. And since then, he's led many, many tours to all corners of the globe. While the global pandemic, sorry, while the global pandemic has kept him largely homebound these past 18 months, I know he's really enjoyed the time he's got to spend with his now three and a half year old son, Rory, his wife, Tanya, and his friends who don't get to see him all that often when he's gallivanting all over the globe. Having said all of this, Glenn is very excited about getting back into the field again with tours through South Africa and Kenya later on this year. I'll be handing over to Glenn shortly, but one last mention to say that as usual, we'll have a question and answer session after the webinar with Glenn and with George, uh, both providing the entertainment on that front. If you do have a question during the webinar, please pop those into the Q&A box or in the chat box, and we'll try and answer as many of those as possible. And on that note, the virtual floor is all yours, Glenn. Hey, Keith, thanks so much for that wonderful introduction. Really kind of you, some, some wonderful words, and I uh, echo a lot of that myself. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you everyone else um, so much for taking the time once again to join me for yet another Rock Jumper Dream Destinations webinar, this time to Taiwan. Uh, my slideshow today showcases the very best birding localities on the island, together with the many spectacular endemics and other special and range-restricted birds that make Taiwan undoubtedly one of the planet's absolute must-visit birding destinations. Situated just off the southeast coast of mainland China, Taiwan offers some of the very best birding and scenery in all of Asia, and perhaps even on Earth. It is undoubtedly one of my favorite destinations, and I've been very fortunate to have led a number of rock jumpers tours to Taiwan over the past decade. So without further ado, let's get stuck into our awesome Taiwan birding and wildlife itinerary, and some of the many highlights that are to be enjoyed during rock jumpers 12 day birding adventure around the island. Starting with just a little bit of geography to kick things off. Um, those of you probably already know where Taiwan is situated, but if not, uh, just a little recap here. Uh, you'll see mainland China and just off the southeast coast line, just north of the Philippines lies the island of Taiwan, roughly about 120 miles long by 60 miles wide. So not a, not a very big island. Um, nicely condensed, easy trip to, to cover in a, in a short 12-day, sort of two-week uh, window period, going for every single possible endemic and all the endemic or near-endemic subspecies uh, available, as well, as well as loads of other great birds, many of which are really rare and difficult to find elsewhere in Asia. Um, just slightly to the west here, you've got the Southeast Asian countries of Vietnam, uh, Laos and Thailand and Cambodia. Further south, you've got Borneo and um, 
to the northeast lies the southern islands of Japan. You've got the Ryukyu Islands here, just um, situated where I'm shining this arrow. There's the island of Okinawa and Amami, and Kyushu and Honshu in, in Japan, further northeast. All right, that's just a map of all the sites that we visit on our rock jump uh, tour to Taiwan. Just a quick five, 12 day trip that goes for every single possible endemic and endemic subspecies. Um, a lot of sites visited, um, some just for half a day, others for a full day. Some of the more quality, real core areas like the Dasweshan area, we visit for a full three days. Um, but yeah, just a little overview of, of where we, we go on our trips. All right, starting with just some of the highlights to be experienced in Taiwan, of which there are so many, but uh, high on the list are all the incredible endemic species to Taiwan. Um, including spectacular swinos and Mikado pheasants, two of my absolute favorites, as well as the Taiwan partridge, a really tricky forest interior species endemic to the island. The spectacular Taiwan blue magpie, another favorite of mine, uh, yellow and chestnut belly tits that are superb little birds, seven endemic laughing thrushes or, or species in the laughing thrush family that include, uh, yeah, millers, uh, leosiclers, and bar wings as well in that little group in the same family as the laughing thrushes and then the undeniably spectacular flame crest which is always a trip uh, or crowd pleaser and a trip favorite and uh, collared bush robins another favorite of mine those are just some of the really sought after endemics of the 29 um, currently recognized endemic species to taiwan um, and an incredible 54 subspecies endemic to the island many of which are almost certainly going to be split in future as full Taiwan endemics, which makes it one of the most endemic rich islands and areas, um, countries, whatever you want to call it, on earth pretty much. It's, it's a real endemic hotspot. So a, a must visit destination for any reasonably keen bull birder, in my opinion. Um, but to boot, you've got a, a number of really special Asian species that are really tough to find elsewhere. It's the place to see Malayan night here and um, which is a really tricky bird to find elsewhere in Asia. You have to hunt the remote corners and, and lowland rainforests of Sri Lanka and South India if you want any type of a chance to see Malayan night here and on their wintering grounds. Whereas in Taiwan, they're absolutely dead cert, super easy. You, you pretty much see them everywhere all the time, which is pretty incredible. Um, it's a really good spot too to catch up with Chinese egret, which can be very tricky to find elsewhere. It is the place to see mountain scarf cell, which is a notoriously tricky bird to find everywhere in its range. A widespread species uh, right from Southeast Asia through the Himalayas that occupies mid-altitude, montane, evergreen forest, but a notoriously tricky bird to find. Almost everyone is birded in Asia and the mountains of Asia has certainly heard mountain scarf cell, but to see it is a completely different ball game. And gosh, it, a species I've almost never seen anywhere else outside of Taiwan. Uh, for some reason, the endemic subspecies there just seems to be a little bit more showy and, and easier to find, coupled with the fact that uh, our, our local guides are, are incredibly good at and knowledgeable at finding them at night. Oriental Pratt is another tricky species that we always see on our trips, and it's a very regular spot for black-faced spoonbill, which uh, outside of Korea and Japan is a, a very tricky bird to find and a, a species that's endangered with a very tiny world population. It's also the place to see fairy pits on their breeding grounds outside of uh, remote corners of Southeast China and uh, Southern Japan, uh, a spectacular pitta. Pittas are my favorite family. Uh, I'd love to see every species um, on earth getting close, but still have a few of the trickier ones to find. And uh, Vival Niltava is probably a bird that a lot of World birders have searched for high and low and, and fallen short with, and is, is pretty guaranteed in, in Taiwan, as well as Japanese paradise flycatcher. To mention just a few, there are loads of other really great special and sought after birds that uh, we all find together with all the endemics on our Taiwan trip. Other highlights, there are loads. Um, besides the birds, there are a number of really interesting mammals. Many of them are nocturnal. We'll go out on night drives looking for red and white giant flying squirrels and uh, Formosan macaques will be around all the time during the day. 
there, little Formosan striped squirrels um, will keep us constant company and, and lots of other great mammals um, will be seen throughout the trip. Spectacular scenery, especially mountain scenery, loads of really high peaks, um, getting to around 13,000 feet, 4,000 meters in elevation. Um, some of them snow capped near the top. Uh, but yeah, make, combined with the, the beautiful, almost pristine mid altitude forest that surrounds them, makes for really dramatic and, and spectacular scenery throughout the trip. Um, Taiwan's proclaimed a lot of its, its land area, especially its forests, as national parks, and they're really well protected and we'll be focusing on a lot of those key areas. The food is delicious, uh, really yummy, yummy, classic sort of Chinese mixed with Southeast Asian, a little bit of Filipino style food, really, really tasty stuff, well prepared. Um, extremely safe and hospitable country as one would imagine really first world, super organized, great infrastructure, excellent accommodations, and also fascinating history. Uh, we'll see a lot of ancient buildings and temples that we'll get to stop and photograph and enjoy during the trip, besides the fantastic birding on offer. All right, so that's just a, a little overview of, of the map that we cover. And um, you'll see right at the top in the Northwest, the first site that we visit on our trip is the Taipei Botanical Gardens and a, a little bit of coastline wetlands and estuaries in the northwest of the of the island and makes for a perfect introduction to Taiwan birding. The uh, Botanical Gardens especially are really enjoyable, easy to walk around in and provide some fantastic birding to kick off the trip. Uh, we'll see a lot of endemics initially right at the botanical gardens, right in the in the heart of Taipei, very close to our accommodation. So just an hour or two in the gardens, meandering around will produce really close views of Taiwan scimitar babbler, as well as the endemic Taiwan barbet, and um, is probably most famous for their population of Malayan night herons, which, as I previously mentioned, is a really tricky bird to find throughout the rest of Asia. Uh, but is virtually guaranteed and really easy to find in Taiwan. Amazingly so. It, it just it, it blows your mind when you've searched so hard everywhere else in Asia for the species and you literally just arrive in Taipei and there they are feeding at the edges of roads, drainage ditches, in the botanical gardens. So close you get to them that you pretty much um, almost too close to photograph them. <laughs> you can literally walk up and, and almost touch them. It's, it's, it's really is quite remarkable. Um, nowhere else in Asia can you see Malayan night terms like in Taiwan. And uh, it also provides good introductory uh, opportunities to, to get to grips with a lot more familiar Asian species, species that are a lot more widespread throughout the continent, things like Rufus cat babbler. Uh, many of these are endemic subspecies too, and may very well be split in, in months or years to come. Light vented or Chinese bulbuls are always present, but really, Pretty bird, always nice to, to catch up with and, and enjoy. And uh, parables are one of my favorite groups of birds as well. And we'll almost certainly find finest throated parables around the gardens and in little thickets nearby in the general area. Always a crowd pleaser. Then we'll, after visiting the botanical gardens, we'll take a short little drive down to the estuary close by and, and work some shoreline, mud flats, um, little coastal lagoons and wetlands, where, which literally teams with birds, a lot of water birds, excellent chance of things like greater painted snipe and white-breasted water hens, jacanas, loads of waders, wetland species, but most notably a very good chance of seeing Chinese or Swinnow's egret in full breeding plumage as they um, move between their wintering grounds in Thailand in Southeast Asia to Eastern China where they breed. But uh, May, June provides an excellent chance of them on passage through the Northwest part of Taiwan. Together with breeding plumage, lesser and greater sand plovers, really spectacular birds in the breeding time of year and breeding plumage sharp-tailed sandpipers as well. A lot of the shorebirds will be on passage through the area and, they will have acquired their full nuptials in April, May, before heading further north to their breeding grounds. Um, and yeah, Taiwan provides a really good chance of finding a lot of passage shorebirds in full breeding plumage. It just provides some really great introductory birding that uh, first arrival day in Taipei. 
From there, our first full day sees us heading south into the forested hills, um, just south of Taipei. You leave the city and almost immediately you get greeted by beautiful, pristine hill, hill forest, an evergreen hill forest, with a little bit of bamboo understory and really quite spectacular. That's a little view of, the, of our birding destination for the morning. As you can see, just almost as far as I can see, beautiful, pristine, evergreen forest that again, teams with endemics as well as a lot of other great near endemics and regionally specific and special species. Probably the most notable of which is the Taiwan Blue Magpie, one of the island's most spectacular endemics. And it's by far our best chance of seeing Taiwan Blue Magpie on the trip. A, a bird that can be really tricky to find elsewhere. So we really want to get to grips with it on that first morning in the forested hill south of Taipei. In that same area, the recently split black necklace scimitar babbler is also a tricky, skulky bird of the understory that we'll hopefully find that morning. Otherwise, we have one more chance on the trip in the Huban area. One of the trickier Taiwan endemics, uh, but we usually manage to find a couple and get some really good views during our time in this area. And uh, great cheek full veta with its very unique thick white eye um, spectacle there's one of the other endemic species that we'll target this morning. Little flocks of them move around in the understory together with uh, singing rufous face warblers that sound like a little telephone ringing. Beautiful little bird with a, a really unique song. And um, the area is also really good for a lot of raptors, things like Cressa Gossel, Bezra, um, Dusky Fulvetta is another tricky bird that we'll look for that morning. Um, together with a, a host of other more widespread species and, and also Taiwan whistling thrush, which is a really tricky bird. I haven't got photographs of it and um, pretty much no, none of us have actually photographed the bird, but we always manage to get some good views of it at dawn at the side of the road feeding in typical whistling thrush fashion. Uh, from the forest of foothills south of Taipei, we then drive quite a long distance, so several hours um, through the afternoon to the Daswishan area. Um, just slightly south in the forest of hills. This is probably the core birding locality on the whole island and harbors about 80% of the island's endemics. We spent two full days here, so almost the equivalent of about three days in total, the two full days uh, working up and down every elevation of the Dust Vishan Road. It's in many respects, if you've been to Bhutan, it's kind of like the Lingmatang Road in Bhutan, which covers an area of about an elevational gap of about 2,000 to 2,500 meters. So from about 1,000 and a half feet to roughly 9,000 feet in elevation. So a huge altitudinal range, right from the lowlands, tropical lowlands, all the way through mid-altitude broadly forest, right up to uh, dense, evergreen coniferous forest with um, extensive bamboo understory at the top and every strata has got its own unique species and some really special spectacular birds available in the dust Shan area. It's probably my favorite area of the trip. The birding is incredible and it, it, like I said harbors almost all of the region's endemics hence it's giving it the most amount of time during the trip. Just a little bit of dust Shan scenery. This is the middle elevation part of the road and some beautiful waterfalls and streams, forested streams, pretty typical montane forest scenery of Asia, almost reminiscent of the Himalayas and parts of Thailand. Um, so the first afternoon we'll get into the Daswishan area and one of the most spectacular endemics that we'll be after is Swinnow's pheasant. This is the male and fortunately uh, they've got a, Taiwan's really well equipped and geared up for bird photographers. So that's a big industry in the country. There are birders, but there are loads of bird photographers. So with that comes little feeding stations, which makes the birders' lives really easy. And um, there'll be a lot of areas where they'll put out little bits of grain or mealworms at the side of the road for the photographers. And these attract great endemics like swinnows, pheasants, and um, Steersley cichlids and as well as things like whitetail, robin, and a lot of other little flycatchers, and yeah, loads of great birds come to these little feeding stations. Inside the forest, things like Taiwan partridge, some of the really tricky species, um, or that would be tricky to find elsewhere if it, if it wasn't for these feeding stations, are really quite easy to find. 
at the side of the road at these little feeding stations. So there's a couple of these on the road that we'll visit in the late afternoon and, and maybe the next day and should provide excellent views and photo ops of Swinnow's pheasant. Uh, the female's not too shabby herself. She's really quite pretty with a golden spangling, kind of similar to a female Kalij or silver pheasant, but slightly different and yeah, endemic to Taiwan. Steers, yeah, cichlids are a real specialty in the laughing thrush family and really quite shy and difficult to photograph. But as, as mentioned, they come to these little feeding stations, which is fortunate because otherwise they can be quite tricky to find if uh, just searching for them naturally within the forest interior at the forest edge. In the lower sections of the road, uh, we'll also see fantastic endemics like Taiwan Yuhina and uh, the endemic subspecies of white-tailed robin, a spectacular bird that's quite widespread through Asia, but never easy to find, but really easy to see in Taiwan. They're particularly showy, um, or seem to be really very easily seen in Taiwan. Um, not a great photo, but a really special bird, the Taiwan or vivid Tava. It's an endemic subspecies to Taiwan, uh, will be sought along the middle stretches of the road very likely to be spit in future as a, as a Taiwanese endemic and by far the easiest place to see vivid Tava anywhere in the world. Uh, the middle section of the road is also excellent for a lot of woodpecker species and just general mixed species flocks. Some fantastic roving flocks with laughing thrushes and full vectors and the understory parrot bulls, that kind of stuff. Um, make for some fantastic birding. The white-backed woodpecker subspecies in the region is often spit as Alston's woodpecker and then would be shared with just a couple of southern J Japanese islands as a, as a near endemic woodpecker species. Has a lot more black on the back and there's a lot more boldy pattern than your typical white-backed woodpecker. Little forested streams uh, will be uh, searched for things like little forktail and, and dippers and, and whistling thrushes and that kind of stuff. And as you work our way higher up the <clears throat> Dust Shan Road, we'll uh, get to grips with large flocks of white whiskered laughing thrush, a beautiful Taiwanese endemic and pleasantly common and vocal. One of those laughing thrushes that occur in big roving flocks of 30 to 40 birds, unlike your really tricky, skulky, difficult laughing thrushes like Rusty and Rufus Crown laughing thrushes that are a lot trickier to find, but occur in the same part of the Dust Shan Road but will require a lot more effort to find. And uh, white-eared sipia, although very common, is not a particularly confiding species. So unfortunately we don't have great shots of it, but a, a really beautiful bird and another Taiwanese endemic that is pleasantly common in mixed species flocks in the mid altitude forests. Then right towards the top of the road, um, we'll enjoy some really easy birding where the birds literally almost hop on your feet Birds seem to be so confiding and showy in Taiwan, which makes for fantastic bird photography. There's absolutely no culture of bird trapping and hunting of any sort in Taiwan. So good numbers of birds, many of which are really confiding and showy and just completely unafraid of people. So you'll have endemics like Taiwan bullfinch and Taiwan rosefinch at point blank range again and again and again. So you really get to absorb them and, and enjoy them. Uh, one of the special endemic mammals that we'll certainly find for most striped squirrel among many others uh, during the trip and as mentioned we'll go out at night searching for owls mountain and, and collared scarf cells and even a chance of the very rare endemic subspecies of Himalayan owl as well as black and uh, red and white giant flying squirrels and uh, a couple of other really interesting nocturnal mammals that are difficult to find but we, we do stand a decent chance of seeing a couple of them. Night walks and excursions are obviously optional and since the days are quite long and especially because the trip runs in the summer months for the most part. We do offer a winter trip too but um, our spring trip is our most popular trip as it combines all the endemics with uh, specialties like fairy pitta. But um, yeah, the, the, it makes for long days. So people often, or folks are often very tired at the end of the day, but there is always the option of, of night excursions, uh, which I'm always up for. And so are all of our guides. All right. Um, yeah, after spending two wonderful full days of birding in beautiful, pristine forests along the Dust Road, 
scoring a huge number of Taiwan's endemics. We'll then spend the last morning just spurning the lower elevation, sort of scrubby secondary forest near our accommodation. And uh, the burning here is really easy and enjoyable, but is mostly for more slightly more widespread species, but no less enjoyable species. Some, some really popular ones like Brown Dipper and Plumbius Red Start along the river, as well as Collared Finchbill. Um, one of my favorites actually, it's quite a common bird, but always quite local and, and habitat specific and just, just a real stunner with a lovely little core as well. And uh, an ever favorite black-throated bush tit in the bush tit family. Very widespread and common throughout Asia, but um, always a, a crowd favorite. And great tree pies are around too in fair numbers, another fairly widespread species, which we'll see in the, in the low elevation forests. But um, we'll also um, target uh, the endemic Taiwan Kwame, which is another type of laughing thrush endemic to the island. And uh, Taiwan, Bamboo partridge, as uh, well as white bellied green pigeons, which are really scarce and localized. And yeah, a lot of other great birds, great chin men events and, and lots of drongos and, and that kind of stuff. Striated swallows are usually around two in fair numbers. All right, so after leaving the Dasrishan area, which is up here, we then drive most of the day through the central part of the country, working our way to the southwestern coastline and the fairly large coastal city of Tainan, but not before we visit the wetlands of Budai uh, close by, which is the place to see black-faced spoonbill in Taiwan. Uh, a real target species, otherwise restricted to parts of Japan and Japan, um, sorry, Japan and, and, and Korea. Um, and there are, although they winter in Taiwan, there are usually at least a few still around in May, June. And we've always managed to get to grips with uh, black-faced spoonbills during our Taiwan tours. In the same area, we usually find oriental pratincoles in fairly good numbers, which can be another tricky to find species elsewhere in Asia. But also in the algae wetlands on the last morning before leaving Tainan, we'll visit the, uh, the actual Jakarta reserve, a special reserve dedicated to protecting pheasant-tailed jacanas uh, where they breed and nest and it's also a really good spot to find yellow and cinnamon bitterns and greater painted snipe, lesser kukuls, there's a couple of other tricky birds, not endemic but, but really nice classic Asian species. Um, but yeah, breeding plumage pheasant-tailed jacanas are absolutely knockout and a, a real showstopper, showcase bird of, of the of the Chicana Reserve in, in that area and, and they're usually posed for fantastic photographs. As mentioned, great chance to of seeing greater painted snipe in the painted snipe family which has only got three representatives, otherwise just the, the Australian painted snipe and the South American painted snipe, both very tricky species to find. All right, uh, leaving Tainan, we then head down further south east towards Kenting and Pingtung, which uh, will be our next destination. Just a one night overnight stay in the Pingtung area. And although it's a, another very good backup chance for Malayan night heron, which you almost certainly would have seen already, but we'll see them there again. Uh, good chance again for Taiwan bamboo partridge, which is a tricky endemic and the endemic subspecies of maroon oriole, which is this most incredible glowing red color. This, this photograph has barely been enhanced. It's, it's just this incredible glowing red and black oriole, which is very likely to be spit as a Taiwan endemic. Not currently recognized, but very good chances of that being spit in future. And if it is split, it will become one of Taiwan's rarest and toughest endemics, virtually restricted to that little tiny south eastern corner of the island and Pingtung is by far the best place to see maroon or the endemic red oriole. Our main reason for stopping in Pingtung for the night. It also breaks the journey nicely up between Tainan and Kenting. Um, so yeah, on to Kenting, just a short drive and then we'll visit the Long Luang National Wetland Reserve in the morning, searching for one of the island's most localized endemics, the Steins Bulbul. Almost a combination of sooty headed and ashy bulbul. It's got the greenish wing like an ashy bulbul with this unique moustache stripe. Um, just kind 
not just another bulbul, I guess, but incredibly localized, in fact, ridiculously so. Uh, it's, its distribution is probably the smallest of any of the Taiwan endemics, but very common and easy to find in its uh, tiny part of its range, but literally on and around the, the Long Grand National Wetland Reserve, we will spend the morning. But the, the reserve also offers some fantastic wetland birding, a lot of uh, wetland sort of ducks and waterfowl species, and good chance too of small and barred button quails in the grasslands, which we sometimes manage to get on the deck, which is always nice. And then from Kenting, we take a ferry which uh, crosses the channel between Kenting and the isolated offshore island of Lanyu, which um, has more affinities with northern Philippines and even south western Japanese islands than Taiwan. A lot of the species are, are otherwise shared only with um, parts of the Philippines and southern Japan. So you've got a lot of really interesting species like brownie at bulbul, which is quite a localized species, otherwise really only found in Japan. And yeah, Philippine cuckoo doves are there, whistling or lanyu green pigeon if split, um, very likely to be split as a, as a lanyu or Taiwan endemic to the island. It's a very distinctive subspecies of whistling green pigeon, which is otherwise only found on the Ryukyu Islands of southern Japan. A uh, beautiful bird with this really bizarre glowing orange, um, bluish purple eye and maroon wings. And um, yeah, as mentioned, uh, the, the avifauna is very much more reminiscent of, of parts of, of Philippines. So quite different to, to Taiwan. Even the people, the culture, everything is completely different. Just by crossing the little ch channel to Lanyu, um, you almost walk into a completely different world in a different country, even though it is technically part of Taiwan. Um, but yeah, very good for, for roosting owls. We'll almost certainly find Ryukyu or if spit lanyu scops up on the day roost. If not, uh, we'll go out at night to find them. And northern bubuk, which is a tricky bird to find elsewhere outside of parts of Japan, will be a big target there too. And we might even find something really obscure like a, a Japanese yellow bunting on passage. May, May June is a really interesting time of year in that area because a lot of birds are coming from the wintering grounds to the breeding grounds further north. So you've got all these passage birds coming through. And you almost certainly find something really interesting and different and obscure while birding uh, Lanyu Island. It also works as a bit of a bird trap in its location where it's situated and um, because it's this little area of land right in the middle of the ocean, it, it's, it's a bit of a migrant trap. A lot of, a lot of migratory birds stop in there on their way north to spend a bit of time feeding. Um, and then the ferry ride is actually really quite interesting. It only takes about two and a half hours the crossing on a really big, comfortable, stabilized ferry so no one gets sick. The conditions are usually quite pleasant, but sea watching can be really interesting and fascinating. And uh, a couple of really special seabirds are often seen during the trip, um, especially on the way back from Lanyu Island. So we'll head out in the afternoon from Kenting to Lanyu, uh, which is notoriously not really that good for seabirds, but on the way back, we'll be doing it um, in the morning. And then we've got an excellent chance of finding bulwars petrels in fairly good numbers. I've had up to 20 bulwars petrels in the crossing before on previous trips, as well as little flocks of street shearwaters that breed in uh, offshore islands of Japan and are usually hang out in that area around Taiwan in, the, in that, the, that time of the year. All right, so heading back to Kenting. As soon as we get back, we'll board our comfortable bus again and start making our way northwards back towards the interior of Taiwan and to the little town of Hubin uh, in the forested foothills of Taiwan. Hubin's undoubtedly most famous for one of the world's most spectacular birds, the fairy pitta, a bird that literally exclusively winters on the island of Borneo, but is virtually never ever seen on its wintering grounds. And one has to go to Kyushu Island of Japan or very remote parts of southeastern China or Taiwan to, to actually see fairy pitta on their breeding grounds. And we've got some really good, reliable sites around the Hubin area in ta Taiwan where we have yet to miss fairy pitta on our May June trips. Uh, they're not always particularly easy, but um, sometimes they oblige really nicely, like this 
specific bird did on a, a trip uh, about a year or two ago. But yeah, during a full day's birding around Huben, we almost, well, we always get to grips with fairy pitters and usually manage to achieve some really good views of them. The town is so famous for the pitter that uh, there's a couple of cafes that are actually dedicated to the pitter and they're really proud of their pitter. I mean, they, they recognize the fact that people come from all parts of the world to that specific part of the country to specifically see fairy pitter. Um, attracts a lot of birders and, and they, they love their pitta and they've, you can see just uh, from this specific cafe, it's actually called the Pitta Cafe and they've got big <laughs> statues of fairy pittas and big sculptures, paintings all around the gardens and they, they love us to come and, and grab a, a coffee and a bite to eat there uh, before or after searching for the pitta, hopefully successfully. But uh, yeah, not just the pitta there, but also a lot of other great birds. And it's one of the best areas too for black necklace, scimitar babbler, and um, Taiwan blue magpie, if we haven't seen them yet. Just a couple of shots from the inside of the civil pitta cafe, quite a cute spot. I, I really enjoy going there. Even the, even the, even the restrooms uh, have a little fairy pitta on the wall. So uh, after leaving Huben, hopefully with Fairy Pitta in the bag, we uh, travel a little bit up into the hills, slightly further up towards the town of Wushan and um, the, oh, sorry, not Wushan, the Lower Alishan. Uh, we will spend a, a night um, mainly targeting Taiwan partridge, a really special bird, fairly unique to that part of the island and really tricky to see outside of the Lower Alishan area. We'll set a a really um, fantastic little um, plantation area that um, provides a, a fantastic base to in which to bird the Alishan area and it's one of the best places also to see mountain scopsal. It is the place to see Taiwan partridge and the hosts are really hospitable, extremely friendly, they, they make be um, beautiful delicious food for us and just a great base. But on, on the way, there's actually some really spectacular scenery too. And we'll stop at a couple of these temples for some, some cultural uh, experiences and photo ops of some ancient temples that are really quite interesting and make a little change to the, to the birding side of the trip. Scenery in that area is also really spectacular. As you can see, once again, just loads and loads of pristine forest, almost as far as the eye can see. There's, there's so much forest still left on, on Taiwan. It's really heart pleasing, especially comparison to, to so much of the world and especially so much of Asia, you know, parts of Borneo and the Philippines are just so deforested. Just so to see so much forest still left on an island with so many endangered or so many endemic species and, and, and fairly, fairly threatened species that occur elsewhere on the continent um, is, is wonderful to see and experience. That afternoon we'll walk in on a little forest trail through the um, beautiful lush evergreen forest to a, a small hive situated inside the forest um, which attracts the endemic Taiwan partridge and we should manage to get some really good close views of the partridge as well as um, the beautiful endemic Swinos pheasant that we would have already seen, but uh, nice to see it in the heart of its classic forest interior type habitat, skulking around like a pheasant would usually do. And um, a lot of other Taiwanese endemics there too, and a, a decent chance of the endemic subspecies of scaly thrush that sometimes split as Taiwan thrush, a very rarely seen species, but certainly a chance there. To, and then at night, uh, looking for mountain scop cells in that area, if we haven't already seen them yet. Leaving um, Lower Alishan, we then head up a little bit further for a full day through Yushan National Park on the way to Wuxia. So we leave Alishan, spend a full day in Wuxia National Park, birding mid-altitude forest, very similar to the Das Wuxian area. Um, and it, it harbors almost exactly the same species as in the Das Wuxian area before heading to Wuxia for a couple of nights. Um, spectacular scenery again as we traverse the mountains of central Taiwan. Man, seeing all this, I just want to go back. Can't wait. It's such an amazing trip. Oh boy. So, 
uh, yeah, Wuxia National Park is a fantastic place to see the really tricky Taiwan bowing. One of Taiwan's trickier endemics, as bowings can often be. Bowings can either really be quite easy, like rusty fronted, or, or, or you get streak throated and, and streak bowings and Taiwan bowing that are really quite tricky. Uh, quite a mixed group of birds. There's six different bowings in, in the world, all in Asia, and they're all in the laughing thrush family. Three are quite easy, three are really quite tricky. Taiwan Bowie is quite a tricky one, but we always manage to find it somewhere, sometime during the trip. It's also probably a, the best place to see Taiwan Shortwing, which has recently been split from White Broad Shortwing. Uh, and then, like I say, backup chances of all of the Adaswishan species. Uh, whatever we might have missed in Adaswishan, very good chance to get them here in Wushan National Park. And um, yeah, penultimate destination of the trip uh, in Wushu, uh, Wushu and the beautiful scenic Taroko National Park, Hehuan Pass, a really high altitude pass at about 10,000 feet in elevation and the legendary Blue Gate Track that always offers some incredible birding and again backup chances for a lot of Taiwanese endemics similar to the Daswishan and uh, Lower Ali Shan, Wushan areas. Again spectacular scenery mostly throughout the trip, pretty consistent, wonderful mountain scenery. This is on the way to Taroko National Park. This is inside the National Park itself. And uh, right above the tree line here at about 10,000 feet, you're looking onto some of the biggest mountains at about 13,000 feet, 4,000 meters elevation. These uh, forest edges are, are the place to, to look for the endemic Mikado pheasant, another spectacular endemic. That was the front cover image that I had was of Mikado pheasant. Taroko National Park is probably the best place to see it. And uh, if we haven't seen it yet, we'll certainly look very hard for Mikado pheasants in this area, together with a lot of other high altitude species. Um, a really tricky bird to find anywhere in Asia, outside of remote parts of Myanmar, Cambodia, and Thailand is the ashy wood pigeon. Uh, but very good chance of finding them along the Blue Gate track. There's usually a couple hanging around there. And um, higher elevation forests. We'll spend some time in, in beautiful swathes of low um, bamboo thickets for golden parrot bulls and the endemic subspecies of white brown bush robin, which will almost certainly be split as a Taiwanese endemic in years to come as somber bush robin. Different call, completely different looking to white brown bush robins on mainland Asia. Uh, the endemic subspecies of yellow belly bush warbler will be sought in that area as well, another high altitude specialty. And one of my favorites, the absolutely exquisite collared bush robin. And here, the male with its gorgeous, fiery red uh, breastband and shoulder patch. And then the, the more dapper little female that's also quite pretty, but markedly different from the male. And um, Taiwan bush warbler, a recent split from russet bush warbler, that's another Taiwan endemic and can be quite confiding in the, the highest stretches of the Hehuan Pass, uh, right up at the top above the tree line in bamboo thickets. More widespread alpine centers are usually around in fair numbers and migratory crested or oriental honey buzzards usually entertain us overhead, as well as the endemic subspecies of spotted nutcracker which uh, is a really cracking little bird, uh, another favorite of mine, high altitude coniferous forests, really spectacular bird that otherwise occurs through parts of the Himalayas. And um, not a great photo, but uh, we'll try and better these in trips to come. But yeah, one of my most <laughs> really favorite birds of the trip and, and always a crowd pleaser and, and a bird everyone really, really wants to see is the little kinglet, um, well in the kinglet family, uh, the flame crest. So similar to fire crest or um, the um, gold crest as well in the same family as them and very similar looking except the fire crest has this incredible fiery reddish orange crest that's underneath the male's floppy black feathers here and doesn't always show it but at our time of year the males will hop around and every now and then if you just keep following one you'll get one flaring its crest in full display and then these under 
uh, feathers, these orange under feathers get flared right up high into the most incredible bright orange crest. And it just, it'll just floor you. I mean, people are just oohs and ahs and oh my gosh, it's just amazing. Um, really awesome little bird of the highest altitude coniferous forests in the area. Um, from Wuxie, uh, we sadly then come to the end of our trip as we work our way into the Puli Valley on the way back to Taipei, looking for the very localized and pretty scarce chestnut belly tit, virtually the only place on the trip where we might see chestnut belly tit. And uh, maybe if you're very lucky, the endemic white-headed subspecies of alpine thrush, um, which will also very likely be spit as, a, as an endemic species in years to come. And um, do a little bit of birding along the north western and northeastern shorelines before heading over to the airport to finish our trip um, but yeah lots of good birding in the north again and um, that's where i've seen uh, the really rare vagrant siberian crane on, on previous trips so every every trip to taiwan produces something really different and unusual over and above all its spectacular endemics and uh, that pretty much concludes our 12 day endemic rich Burning trip of Taiwan. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining. Fantastic, Len. Wow. Um, where, where are we going? I mean, <laughs> sign me up. <laughs> we're, we're all we're all very keen to to get back out there. Obviously, yeah, that's a great but, trip. Um, yeah. yeah, spectacular part of the world and Asia. I mean, look, a lot of it is closed at the moment, but um, but yeah, these these yeah. places will will open up. We're seeing more and more spots opening up around the world. So um, we'll just give them some time. But yeah, Taiwan is Taiwan's still there, and all those endemics and all those special birds you were talking about still remain. So uh, yeah, something to look forward to in the future, no doubt. Thanks so much, Glenn. Absolutely wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, so many great photos as well, and and lots of background information as well on on all the sites and um and whatnot yeah just 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 really great um so yeah just quickly before we go off to to q a uh we'll definitely be having a webinar in two weeks time however just to let you know final confirmation will only be forthcoming next week um it's highly likely that it'll be on morocco uh but all of, all the covid related work schedules it's a little bit difficult for our two leaders to make firm plans uh, and in this case, we'll only have final confirmation in a few days' time. So next week, we'll announce that. Look out for the, uh, for the email in that regard. Uh, but highly likely that it, that it will be Morocco, and that'll be in two weeks' time. Uh, but yeah, we thank you for your understanding. And on that note, I'd like to hand over to, to George and Glenn for some q and I know there's been a, a bunch of questions that have come through. So over to you guys. Thanks, yes, indeed. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Keith. And Glenn, thanks so much, man. Really, really a great talk in a fascinating area, one that I do not know particularly well. I've always wanted to go. Uh, and yeah, we got a bunch of questions here. Um, you mentioned um, that the best, you know, we, we do our trips in the spring and in the winter. Um, best months? Do you have a preference? Uh, folks are also wondering, you know, if you could elaborate a little bit more on the differences. Uh, yeah. Sure. Those two trips. So the birding itself is virtually identical between winter and spring. You almost certainly going to see all of the endemics or 95 to 98, maybe 100 percent of the endemics in each season, whether it's spring or in winter. Um, winter birding in many parts of the world is actually really underrated and can be very easy and rewarding. So for endemic species, absolutely fantastic. Um, but, but so is spring. Um, so as far as the endemics are concerned, either the trip. But if you want to see fairy pitta, you have to go in spring, early summer. So from about end of April is pushing it, but usually May into th right through June, early July. So flat bang, when we offer, offer our trips usually around the middle to end of May, middle of June, beginning to middle of June for fairy pitta. Um, and then a chance of a couple of other trickier species, things like um, Chinese egrets, also only in spring. And yeah, otherwise very similar trips. Um, so spring, early summer is obviously warmer. Uh, it's quite hot in the lowlands, quite humid. The mountains are temperate. Uh, chance of rain, it's never usually a big issue, but um, chance of some thunder showers and a bit of rain drizzle on and off 
mostly in the late afternoon, evenings through the night. Winter's a lot drier, um, so almost no rain. Cold in the mountains, but not freezing, just, just colder and, and temperate and pleasant in the lowlands. So climate-wise, if you like the cold, if you struggle with the heat, but you still want to see the endemics go in winter, if you don't mind a bit of heat in the lowlands, and you really want fairy pitta to boot over and above all the endemics go in spring. That's really the only difference, to be honest. Nice. Cool. Yeah, and you mentioned the weather differences. Um, you know, some folks were wondering how, what the pace of the trip is like and how physically challenging it is. And, and uh, Sure. It's, it's one of the easiest trips we offer. Um, really easy. Nothing is too fast-paced. The birding's pretty easy. The endemics are all mostly quite easy. The walking's very easy. Almost all the walking in all the areas is just along roads, gravel tracks, usually flat or downhill. We try and park the bus, you know, higher up and then sort of walk down, similar to, to most parts of Asia. If you bird a part of Thailand, China, Bhutan, it's, we try and keep the kind of pace the same. So easy walking generally downhill along roads. Every now and then onto a little path. Um, but even the forest trail for the Taiwan partridge is really quite easy. It's not a it's not a far trail at all. It's maybe 500 meters in length along a fairly easy forest trail. Uh, the birding in the lowlands is very easy and relaxed. Uh, um, a lot of scoping birds, driving, getting out, spending half an hour, an hour in the area, putting the telescopes up, really absorbing and saturating all the all the birds and the views. Um, the drives, no drives are particularly long. The longest drives maybe one day drive from Daswishan to Thailand is about eight hours broken up um, with them, some morning birding and a couple of stops along the way getting in there in the afternoon and still doing a little bit of afternoon birding. And otherwise, very few drives that are more than four or five hours at a time. Others, most, most of the drives are only two to three hours in length. And um, just yeah, so a lot of time in the field, a lot of birding. Um, it's also it's, it's sort of on and around the equator. I mean, it's, it's just north of the equator. So days in the summer are longer than sort of six to six. So you're looking at um, sort of 5, 5.30 to around sort of six birding. And then, yeah, with breaks in between, um, sit down lunches, dinners, and then completely optional night activities. Um, so if you're too tired, you really don't need to take part in those. A lot of the night birds too, like the scop cells and the, and the northern boob on land you, we see during the day anyway. So it's, it's really just for things like mountain scop cell that you want to head out at night. Pace is pretty easy, pretty relaxed. And, and, and because the accommodations and the food and the logistics and the transport so comfortable, it just, it, it makes it really enjoyable. So even if there's a, a day that's a little bit longer and a bit more strenuous, it, it doesn't feel like it because everything's just so comfortable. And yeah, no, it's, it's not a difficult trip at all. Sounds pretty laid back and, and, and fun. Um, and it looks like the hills that you showed were pretty low lying. I don't know about the mountains. Some folks were curious about how high we get in the mountains, what the highest elevation is that we'll reach. Highest elevation we'll reach, so the highest peak, Wushan Peak, is at around 4,000 meters, so around 13,000 okay. feet. But yeah. the, so the, the highest we actually get ourselves in elevation is about 10,000 feet, 3,000 meters. So just at and around the tree line there. And most of the trip is between about 1,000 and two and a half thousand meters, so about yeah, 3,000 to eight, 9,000 feet, okay. so hill, lower hills, mountains, but um, quite a few days also in the lowlands at sea level, but not, not above 10,000 feet. And, and, and just, when we do get up to 10,000 feet, it's usually only for a couple of hours at a time. Okay. And, and, and not much walking at all, sort of standing at the edge of the forest, watching Taiwan bullfinches hopping around, Taiwan rose finches and scoping Mikado pheasants and hopping back, back in the bus and driving a little bit lower. Very, very easy. Nice. Uh, Fraser McConnell was wondering if it's possible to get Chinese crested terns. Um, obviously a super rare bird. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. 
it's uh, yeah. I mean, what a what a great bird, and it actually breeds just slightly north of there regularly. Um, we've often thought about actually adding on a little extension for Chinese crested tern at the end of the trip. It's something we might do in future. To be honest, I have um, sort of thought about it and discussed it with um, our ground agent, and he's pretty keen to set it up. We aren't offering it just yet. We have seen Chinese crested tern before on Lanyu Island on passage between their wintering grounds in the in um, Indonesia back north, but, but it's very unlikely to to get one on the schedule trip that we do. The best if if we don't start offering a little extension for Chinese crested tern, um, the best is then if you really want to see it to maybe add on a day or two and head up to mainland China to the breeding grounds and then get them there which is what we offer on our Southeast China trip. Gotcha. But pretty easy to arrange, but yeah, currently not part of, of the trip itself. But a chance, probably like a, maybe a 5% chance of seeing it on Lanyu or on the boat trip, on the ferry trip. And how do we get the, um, the endemic species and subspecies on, on our tours typically? Um, do we do we get most of them, and and how many species generally are we in the ballpark for 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 the the whole tour? So we are we on previous trips. So all our trips combined, we have scored between ninety seven and one hundred percent on the endemics. Oh. We've only ever missed one endemic on on a couple of trips, and most of our trips we've managed to get one hundred percent of endemics. Um, there are two or three trickier ones that we have, one of which we've missed before. Uh, the Rufus Crown Laughing Thrush is, I think, the only endemic we've previously missed. But we, we've recently haven't missed any. We've, we've hit 100% on our last few trips. We found a couple of good stakeouts for Rufus Crown Laughing Thrush that used to be tricky on prior trips. Of the endemic subspecies, of the 54, we get around, usually around 40 or so, 40 to 45. There are some that are really tough and kind of off the route or um, it's mostly the ones that are very unlikely to be spit in future that we're not sort of actively targeting that we'll miss. Um, so yeah, usually around yeah 85% of, of the endemic, subs, uh, endemic subspecies, yeah. Excellent. Um, and, uh, and trip totals. Yeah, I think the whole trip list itself is around. It's not a it's not a high number trip. Um, gosh, I must actually check I've that out. Yeah, I've got it here, Ben. I've got Sorry. it here. The trips the trips have all ranged between one six eight and one eighty four species. Okay. Nice. So a huge, yeah, a huge chunk of endemics and, and endemics. It's a great species. trip for obviously. It's a key trip for big listers if you want to you know, targeting the endemics. It's, it's a must-do trip if you're a world birder that wants to get six, seven, eight thousand birds. But it's also it also works as a really good introductory trip for, for like a first-time Asian birder because it's so manageable. It's it's just this nice introduction to a lot of Asian families and groups of birds. And it's just it's such an easy and manageable first trip because it's you know there's there aren't that many species. Uh, Right, yeah. a lot of pretty, a lot of pretty showy birds too. It looks like too. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned that it's quite a good photography trip. Um, mm, excellent photography, yeah. Really yeah, good. that with all the feeding stations, some folks were concerned about whether the feeding stations would be close to roads or if ethical photography was practiced. Uh, also, um, uh, Elise and Dave. They were wondering what kind of camera gear you bring, what, what kind of uh, camera lens you recommend for a trip like that. Uh, for general bird photography, I, I, you, know, you wouldn't want really less than a 300 millimeter. So, I mean, myself, I've got a 100 to 400 image stabilized Canon lens, and that works really well. It's a good versatile lens, uh, good value. Um, you know, with, I mean, I've got a 7D Canon and, and that, that setup works really well for bird photography pretty much anywhere, but especially in the forest here. So anything, I mean, a 100 to 400 is kind of perfect or a fixed 400 or a fixed 300, maybe a 1.4 converter for the open areas. Converters don't really work that well in forest habitats. A lot of the birding and photography is in and around forest, but usually at the edge. Um, so you want the range 
a lot of the birds are quite small. So, yeah, but if, I mean, if you, if you have a 500 or 600 mil lens, bring it, you'll use it. Um, just tricky to lug around, you know, and it's really heavy to carry. And stuff. So I think a, a balance of, of, of sort of a 300 or 400 millimeter lens is usually the best middle of the range option. Yeah. yeah. And, and this trip would be the same. Yeah. yeah. Nice. The birding yeah, ethics and that, because I, and I know there are quite a few people who are a little bit concerned about feeding stations and that kind of thing. To be honest, it's such a big thing in Asia and it's not going to change. And it, it, it doesn't, it is, there's no disruption to the birds. In fact, it, it only benefits the species. The, they occur at high densities where there are feeding stations. They're more obliged because there's no hunting or trapping. It's not an issue. So it's different to other parts of Asia where there's a lot of trapping and, and cage bird you know, activity and that, and where feeding stations can be detrimental to the birds sometimes. But in Taiwan, because there's none of that, and it's purely for bird photographers, and the birds are so used to the bird photographers. I mean, it's day in, day out. Local Taiwanese are going with 800 mil lenses in long lines and, and, you know, blasting away at the birds. And the birds just don't care. They're just so used to people. So it's not, it's not detrimental to the birds at all. We just benefit from it in, in that the birds can be easily seen and would otherwise be really tricky to find. Um, so, yeah, and we don't spend too much time around the feeding stations. There are only a few around. There may be three or four that we'll visit. We'll visit them for maybe half an hour to an hour at a time, get the birds that we need, enjoy the good close views, get some good photos and move on. Most of the birding is away from feeding stations and just general mixed flock birding, you know, along roads and tracks and that. Well, yeah, that's kind of the way I imagined it. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the limit is for our Taiwan groups. Is it eight or 10 people per trip? Is that normal? Yeah, I've done trips with both eight and 10. I'm not sure what the... the okay, there was, that was one question. Are at the moment. Um, the other was field guide. Is there, a, is there a field guide or an app you recommend, Glenn, for this trip? I don't know of any app for the area, but the the birds of east of, of China. So um, uh, it's the I think it's the Phillips Field Guide. It's even though it's slightly out of date, is the best option and includes all the birds of Taiwan. Nothing's really changed in that area. Um, the taxonomy hasn't changed too much, and even even recently, spits endemic species are well covered in the book. And um, yeah, so that's, as far as I'm aware, that's still the best field gun for the area. There's, there's actually, there certainly would be scope for a, a new field gun for the general area, the whole part of China. Um, I th the, oh, the, oh the, I'm simply thinking the field gun to the birds of East Asia yeah. is actually probably the best by Mark Brazil, that would that mm -hmm. would probably actually be the best field guide. And that is brilliant. That is fantastic. So I've got both of those. And yeah, I'm just thinking, so the Phillips is good, but a little bit outdated. But the, yeah, the uh, the Mark Brazil Birds of East Asia is up to date, excellent, fantastic illustrations, covers Taiwan, plus it also covers Eastern China and Japan. Excellent. Yeah, a lot of folks thanking you, Glenn, for, for a great presentation here. And uh, that we're, that's, great. that's Thank you. gone through most of the questions here. I did, I did want to ask you myself uh, a couple of things. The, first of all, you mentioned the Wame, um, which I kind of forgot like about them. Uh, we see them commonly on Hawaii, and you hear them a lot on the Hawaii tour, uh, those of us. Wow. That, yeah, which right sounds totally strange. Is that is that a pretty common bird in in, in its in in Taiwan? Do you see a lot of those, or do you see a no, couple? not at all. No, it's quite a rare bird actually. And I think okay. most of those huame would be Chinese huame, not Taiwanese. Okay. So they're recently. Right. I'm species, sure that's true. Yeah, kind of the same, very similar species, but that's yeah, what I was. Huame, huame. I, so, I thought but, of it as a Chinese bird. So when you even, mentioned it as an, an yeah, endemic. so. It's just a recently spit endemic from Chinese Huame. Looks okay. similar, call slightly different. In, yeah. Um, but no, on both China and Taiwan, quite a rare 
secretive skulky bird. We usually don't see it more than maybe once or twice a trip, and you really have to specifically target them. Yeah. I've, I've heard some amazing uh, stories from people of, of certain species. I've never been to uh, Hawaii, but things like Red Bull Leothrix Le 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 and, um, gosh, even, uh, what's that, endemic Frank into Ethiopia that's... Um, oh, there's all, there's Urkel's Black. Urkel's Frank. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're all over. Dark birds all over in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah, amazing. Yeah. Uh, no, it's pretty weird. It's really, yeah. yeah. Practically in shopping centers and stuff there. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty weird. Yeah. Cool. Um, also, at one point you mentioned the food. How How is the food overall? Is there a particular meal you always look forward to? Anything authentic that uh, folks you'd really That's recommend they try? Pretty much uh, enjoy and love all Chinese and most Asian food. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I like I like a lot of I like the spicier food, but it's in Taiwan. There's not much spicy food. It's it's pretty typical Cantonese style, I guess, um, Asian Chinese food. So a lot of stir fry type dishes with either pork or chicken and veg, lots of vegetables. Um, yeah, a lot of lot of vegetable dishes um, with, with with sauces and, and mostly stir fry type stuff. Uh, nothing really particular, but just a good spectrum and a good, good variety and, and, and a good, good number of vegetables, which I always enjoy and uh, fairly healthy and yeah, just generally good food. Nice. Well, it's almost lunchtime here. So that's pretty inspiring stuff. Thanks, Glenn. Really great uh, presentation. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, George. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Keith. Uh, absolutely, again, yeah, wonderful. Thanks for that uh, Q&A session. Thanks everyone for, for joining us and for all the questions. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you in two weeks time at the same place uh, for a little a little Morocco. Uh, we we'll hope, hope that one's on the card. So, but yeah, thanks again, folks, for joining and, uh, and George for joining me this evening. And Glenn, yeah, great presentation. Thanks, mate. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Well, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.